So for research papers and dissertations, should results as a chapter stand on its own, or should it be combined with discussion? Well, it depends. It depends on the journal, depends on the university, depends on the authors, depends on whether it is a paper or a dissertation, whether it is written to disseminate research findings or written for education and assessment purposes, it depends on the research methodological design of the study, it depends on numerous other things. So in this video, let's take a look at 10 things which might influence one's decision regarding whether or not results should be combined with discussion. Firstly, and this is something important for us to recognize, some journals, some universities, some researchers clearly like to combine results and discussion together into one section in the final research paper or in the dissertation, whereas others prefer to separate them. So clearly, both approaches are in use. There's no clear right or wrong here. Both approaches would have advantages and disadvantages. It is simply a matter of what we value and prioritize. And this is probably the first and most important thing we should recognize when deciding which approach approach to go for. Both approaches are reasonable for certain situations. These two approaches exist for a reason. Which one is better depends on the situation. Second point, some people might look at this issue as a qualitative versus quantitative issue. Their view is that for qualitative research, results and discussion should be combined, and for quantitative research, results and discussion should be two different chapters. But the fact of the matter is, we do see quantitative studies published in highly respectable scientific journals which have their results and discussion combined. And at the same time, we also see qualitative studies published in highly respectable journals which have results and discussion as two distinct chapters. So to say that this issue is purely a quantitative versus qualitative divide is not completely accurate. There are other factors at play here. And what are some of these other factors? Well, let's talk about them. Point number three. So one of the factors which would often determine which structure should be used is very simple. If you're writing a paper to be published in a particular journal, well, obviously, do what the journal asks. If this journal's guidelines for authors say results and discussion should be two different sections, well, let's do that. But if the journal's guidelines say that the two sections should be combined, well, we'll combine them. When we are trying to get published in a particular journal, Generally speaking, we do what the journal asks. Most of the time, the journal's guidelines for authors are not negotiable. Well, sometimes maybe you can negotiate a little bit, but most of the time, we can't. So this means, in practice, a pragmatic determining factor for the structure of the paper often is, very simply, what the journal requires. Fourthly, when it comes to writing a thesis or a dissertation, if your university gives you clear instructions regarding whether these two sections should be combined or not, follow the instructions. That's easy enough. But if you have the freedom to choose as a student, then I would humbly suggest that you consult with your research advisor or research supervisor and jointly decide whether these two sections should be combined or not. What are the reasons some researchers and journals prefer to combine results and discussion? Well, a major advantage of combining results and discussion is that this would increase the readability of the paper. For some readers, it might be difficult to understand the results without clear and proper interpretation and explanations. For example, if we take a study which performed highly advanced statistical analyses in the results section, all these statistical stuff could be confusing and difficult to understand unless one is specifically trained in that analytical approach. So for many readers, statistical results are not very meaningful or useful if they do not come with clear and proper interpretations and explanations. So for journals whose main readers are members of the general public or practitioners in the business field, it makes sense that the journal would require that results and discussion be combined so as to increase the readability of the paper for the reader. Point number six. Another consideration for which approach to use, combining the two sections or not, relates to assessment of research studies. One of the key functions of research journals is to disseminate research findings, and as such, they would want to increase the readability of the papers so that more people can understand and enjoy the papers that they publish. But in some cases, researchers conduct research studies not to be published, but to be assessed, like when you are writing a thesis or a dissertation. So in this respect, based on what I have read for the purpose of writing the script for this video, some academics argue that for dissertations, it is better to have results and discussions separated so that each 
component of the research study can be properly assessed. Having the two sections combined and incorporated as one might indeed increase readability for non-experts, but doing so makes it tricky for the professor or the assessor to judge what was found and how it was analyzed versus what were the interpretations and opinions of the researcher. Next point, consideration number seven. Whether or not to combine results in discussion, well, what type of research is it? So here we're getting into the qualitative-quantitative divide a little bit. Some researchers are of the opinion that qualitative research can benefit from combining results and discussion. The reason for this is, for many qualitative research studies, the data analysis process involves the researcher's subjective interpretation of the data. And as such, since the researcher is already exhibiting a certain level of subjective interpretation and discussion when analyzing the data, it would make sense to have the analysis or results and discussion combined. Well, I can certainly see the logic in that. But on the other hand, with this argument, people can still disagree. Some argue, well, it is true that qualitative data analysis involves more subjective interpretation, but analysis is still different from discussion. All the coding and thematic analysis are part of the analysis, and discussion is different. Discussion is where we would further compare and contrast the outcomes of the analysis with other literature and prior research. So there may still be some key distinctions between qualitative analysis and discussion. They argue the subjective and interpretive aspects of qualitative analysis would not be sufficient to warrant the complete diffusion between results and discussion. So this is really a point of ongoing debate. Next point, so consideration number eight. Should results and discussion be combined? Well, this consideration says we need to take into account the nature and the amount of results. Let's take an experimental study as an example. We'll take that power study, which is the study that we talked about on this channel earlier. In that study, which used an experimental design, they had an experimental condition versus a control condition. And the researchers measured the performances of the two different groups. And they were interested in the differences between the two conditions. For such a study, it would be very clear to first present the results and then discuss the results. The results section would be quite brief and to the point because essentially the results would describe statistical facts regarding the performances of the two different groups and the statistical differences between them. And then in discussion, we can discuss what these results might mean, theoretically, practically, scientifically, or managerially, etc. In such a study, results and discussion really do have different functions and serve different purposes. And now let's take a look at this exploratory inductive research study, a qualitative study. After the method chapter, what follows immediately is discussion. Well, this is because the findings of this study, the various themes, only emerged through discussing and interpreting the data. So clearly, the authors thought this paper would flow better if results were incorporated fully into the discussion section. When we contrast this experimental study with this exploratory study, we see that the specific research design and the nature of their results might have a bearing on the author's decision regarding how results and discussion are best presented, combined or separately. Next point, consideration number nine. Is the paper or thesis presenting just one single study or multiple studies? Many of the interesting research papers that we have reviewed on this channel have multiple studies included in one single paper. The different studies included in the same paper are dealing with the same overarching topic, but each study in the paper would address a specific aspect of that topic. When we look at these papers which are dealing with multiple studies in one paper, one could argue that there is always a clear distinction between results and discussion, even when a particular individual study in that paper might have its results and its discussion combined, because overall there is always a general discussion chapter at the end of the paper, which would systematically discuss the different results of the different studies included in that paper in relation to each other and prior research and literature. In other words, if you have a multiple study design for your paper or dissertation, then my opinion is that you absolutely should have an overall general discussion section which stands on its own. For the specific individual studies included in your multi-study paper, whether or not you'd like to combine results and discussion for them is really a matter of choice. Sometimes we see just results, sometimes we see results and discussion, sometimes we see results as a section on its own and then an interim discussion. 
No matter how we do it for these individual studies, for the paper as a whole, there is always a general discussion section at the end because there is a need for it. We have so far discussed nine factors which may be relevant for when we are trying to decide whether results and discussion should be combined or not. I'm going to end this video by adding a number 10 here, the researcher's personal conviction. Having observed and to some extent participated in this discussion at work, I've noticed and realized that for some researchers this debate really reflects a personal belief. Because this debate goes beyond the superficial chapter structure of a paper or dissertation, it reflects the researcher's ontological and epistemological beliefs. That's why this debate can get really heated sometimes, because it touches on something that is beneath the surface. So I think, once again this is just my opinion, but Respect. Let us respect each other and each other's different opinions and convictions. Let us agree to disagree. Let's recognize that both approaches have advantages and disadvantages, and which approach is better for a specific situation depends on different factors. I think we all recognize that research is a rather complex subject, so when discussing matters related to research or research design, it is probably a good idea not to try and oversimplify things, because certain things are supposed to stay nuanced. Alright, that's it for this video. What do you think about this topic? Do you think results and discussion should be combined? Please leave your thoughts and comments down below. Thanks for watching this Randy Race Random video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.